be here and uh, thank uh, uh, the Castle Craig Hospital for sponsoring me to come and speak to you. Um, so I now have to use the controls. Uh, so what are we going to cover in just 40 minutes? The physics of the atmosphere, the physiology of oxygen, the pathology of lack of oxygen and inflammation, and then pharmacology, drugs and oxygen. So uh, this, there's not very much to go at and we'll obviously do this very quickly. What we don't realize, and in fact Christoph has just introduced it, is of course we're all breathing. It's so, it's so intuitive, it's automatic, we can barely see the fact that we're all breathing, and in fact the most important use of breathing is actually to speak and to make yourself heard. Well, not really. But atmospheric pressure, and the reason we can breathe, is due to gravity. That was the International Space Station you were looking at on, onto the Earth, and the air on the Earth is pulled down by gravity. This is inside the International Space Station, and this is actually the hyperbaric chamber. So the International Space Station has to recreate the atmosphere in this room. It recreates the pressure that is in this room and the gas content. However, astronauts can develop decompression sickness the nitrogen in the body can actually cause damage, including damage to the brain. So they have to have a hyperbaric chamber. So atmospheric pressure. Hyperbaric, it's a very, very um, abused term. We have to define baric. And baric is the atmosphere in this room. We're not actually at sea level. In fact, I've got a barometer in my watch. I could tell you the pressure in this room. And of course it varies with the weather. But if we don't define baric oxygen, how can we define hyperbaric oxygen treatment? So, at sea level, the pressure is designated as a simple atmosphere. This is arbitrary, it's called one atmosphere absolute. And 21% of that pressure of one is exerted by the pressure of oxygen. And 78% is due to nitrogen. So this is Dalton's law of partial pressures. So if we take the air pressure in this room that you're breathing at the moment, and we look, it's about 160 millimeters of mercury, but it doesn't really matter what units we use, because what I'm going to show you on this slide is this is the drop that occurs in the airway, in the lungs. And then this is the drop that occurs in the blood, going to eventually the cells and your brain contains somewhere around 100 billion. I'm not quite sure who counted them. It'd take you a long time to count 100 billion. And apparently there are 70 trillion cells actually in your body. Again, who counted them? But going down this cascade, which is called the oxygen cascade, we go from roughly 160 down in the cells to 10 units of oxygen. Now, if you introduce a resistance at any point in this cascade, for example, if you've got airways disease, um, ob chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or if you have a problem in the blood, you're anemic, or a problem in the transfer of oxygen in the tissues, then insufficient oxygen can actually reach cells. And it's only the oxygen that reaches the cells that's important. I thought I'd put this in to show you the lungs which are inside your chest. Again, we don't normally like to look inside and think about it, but there are in fact 20, beg your pardon, 22 branches from, from the trachea, the bronchi, all the way down to the terminal alveoli of the lung. And of course, that's the pathway air has to take until finally it meets the blood. Well, <clears throat> some time ago, Dr. Michael Mosley, who's now a well-known TV personality, um, did a, a program, The Wonderful World of Blood. And what he did was to take a sample of the blood from a vein and then put it in a chest tube and oxygenate it. So he's bubbling oxygen through a tube into this blood. This is actually his venous blood. And you can see it, it's a dark maroon, whereas the arterial blood is bright red. Well, <clears throat> you would think that doctors know that blood is not blue. Well, this is taken from the Sunday Times colour magazine, 
and it's a, a journalist called Matt Rudd, Rudd who interviewed a doctor in London, an eminent doctor in London, about why veins are blue. Now, it's very easy to see on the back of your hand that veins are blue. Why are they blue? So he asked this eminent doctor, why are veins blue? And she said, it's because red blood, red blood cells travel from the heart out to the body's extremities where they give up their oxygen. The deoxygenated blue blood cells then travel back to the heart. Now you've just seen that they're maroon. And this doctor will have taken many samples of blood from veins, and it's never blue. Why are veins blue? Because of the material in the wall of the vein. And they're blue in every textbook, which is termed a convention. In other words, we have to distinguish arteries from veins, so we make arteries red and veins blue. <coughs> what I'm using this to illustrate is that we really are in something of an educational black hole in medicine. Because oxygen has been sidelined. And what we're really talking about is using oxygen as a treatment, in effect, in a parallel universe to the normal practice of medicine. So, thank you, pardon. A very tiny control. Oh, what's happened? Ah. It's obvious that uh, I've upset the gremlins. <laughs> I've been criticised my own profession, and now I'm getting them. <laughs> if I'd done something with this? Oh, okay, okay. Um, did I do that? No. I mean, surely it's not possible. To <laughs> so, now we're going the correct way. So, from the same programme, um, Dr. Mosley said, but there are limits. Blood can hold, only hold so much oxygen. Once each red blood cell is saturated, Blood cannot take any more. Not true. Here is a doctor who has a ma massive audience, television audience in the United Kingdom, telling you something that simply isn't true. Why? Because nobody at medical school is teaching medical students about oxygen. So we're allowing doctors to qualify, not understanding oxygen. Now imagine that, that I go up to a, a doctor and say, you don't know anything about oxygen. It's about like a punch in the face. You can't do that. I mean, obviously, if you want to upset someone, you can do it, but it's not very productive. So blood, in fact, can carry in the plasma at higher pressures enough oxygen to sustain life without blood. And here's the diagram, and I'm not going to spend time on this, but basically, this is the amount that's carried in hemoglobin, and this is the amount that goes up and up and up as we increase the pressure of oxygen that's breathed, until eventually, at this sort of level, you don't actually need red blood cells in the circulation at all. So, <clears throat> only the oxygen that is actually dissolved in the plasma surrounding red cells can be transported into the cells where you need it. Very simple statement. And of course, oxygen is used. It's actually the most frequently prescribed agent in clinical medicine. So, Everybody in hospital sees people with the prongs stuck up the nose or a dangly mask. Um, so it's 100% oxygen that's being supplied. So this little mask, a lovely little boy with nice brown eyes, this little mask is actually being provided with 100% oxygen. But as you can see, it has big holes in it, deliberately, to let in air, to drop the oxygen level, because the, the feeling in medicine is oxygen is toxic. Now, if I had the time, I would go into the background to that, because having written a book about oxygen and the brain, obviously, if you put your head above the parapet, then you've got to be aware and know your facts. But the actual oxygen level that is going down this little boy's airway is about 24%. Why? Because the clinical objective of giving oxygen in every hospital in the country is simply to ensure that red blood cells are indeed red. And that's a clinical endpoint, it's a constant. So Dr. Mosley then stayed in a hypobaric room with hypoxia, equivalent to actually being on the top of Mont Blanc, breathing 12% oxygen. So this is what we call hypoxia or hypoxia. In other words, he was deliberately exposed to almost half the level of oxygen that you're breathing at the moment. Why did he do that? Because he was actually studying the production 
of a hormone that produces red blood cells. So we all produce it. We produce, apparently, again, I don't know who counted them, about two million red blood cells every second. It's extraordinary. We're dealing with astronomic numbers for, for all of these parameters. And all of that is under the control of EPO, and you'll have heard of athletes being doped with EPO, given it deliberately to increase their red cell count in athletic events. So what he found was that if he stayed four hours with half the oxygen level that you're breathing at the moment, he stayed four hours, EPO level, erythropoietin, went up by 40%. Now just think about it for one moment. He's breathing less oxygen, but he's producing more EPO and more red cells. So this is a paradox. And in fact, it is the paradox of life, because what we know is that oxygen controls genes. So my first introduction to the background to this was this paper in Nature, a top journal in 2003. Oxygen and the inflammatory cell, and I'm going to talk a lot more about oxygen in a moment. But this protein, if you look at the words hypoxia-inducible factor 1, well, think about it again. Lack of oxygen is hypoxia. Lack of, oxible, lack of oxygen inducible factor 1 regulates the expression of over 30 genes. It's now 8,883 at the last count. So oxygen is actually a gene controller. And this is where our medical students are not receiving the information. They're being taught about the importance of blood levels, the hemoglobin saturation levels. They are not being taught that oxygen is actually the prime controller of most of our important genes. And so this Carl Nathan says it's striking that a single molecule should emerge as the master regulator in two such diverse settings as hypoxia, lack of oxygen, and inflammation. And those two factors are actually related. Well, I don't expect you to really look at this diagram, um, but this is from uh, redrawn from Nathan's paper. All I want you to look at is this, which is lack of oxygen, this protein, which I've already introduced, hypoxia-inducible factor 1, and this agent, vascular endothelial growth factor. BEGF. Why am I going to focus on that? Because this is how we all start. We all start with a single cell. It grows dramatically into a ball of cells, getting all its oxygen via diffusion from the liquids in the womb. If it didn't grow blood vessels and a heart and a circulation, none of us would be here. What controls that? It's controlled when the oxygen level actually falls, the genes that are responsible for forming blood vessels and also for the, forming the heart and for forming blood, those genes are upregulated by oxygen. Oh? Cut off again. Not me. I only press the next button. <laughs> can, I, can I do something? Uh, press escape. Top escape. Left. Escape. Thank you, I'll know in future. <clears throat> this is the surface of human brain. And presumably, we all have this appearance, so if you take the lid off and look inside, we'd all look like this. However, look under the surface. This happens to be the gray matter, the cortex of a mouse. One cubic millimeter of the gray matter in your brain has a thousand capillaries. It is utterly astonishing. Why? Because the nerve cells have such a high metabolic rate, they need a lot of oxygen. And that's why there are so many capillaries. However, we've got to focus a little bit further down into the microcirculation. So you remember that arteries feed capillaries, capillaries feed veins. And it's the smallest veins that are so crucial in the brain and so relevant to the problem of drugs, alcohol and addiction. Unfortunately, I can't attribute this slide to anyone because I picked it off the internet and it, it wasn't attributed. So someone very kindly has done a brilliant presentation here. So what are we looking at? We're looking inside the brain in a schematic 
And this is, oh, my apologies. This is, in fact, oh dear, I'm not doing very well here. Press escape. It's really a very tiny box. This is a venule, the very tiniest veins in the brain. And so you can see the red blood cells surrounded by plasma. And so the oxygen carried in the plasma, in the, in, in, by the red cell, has to offload into the plasma and then go through the wall into the tissues. So this is called an endothelial cell. And in the brain, the endothelial cell junctions are in fact sealed by an extraordinary cell called the astrocyte. And these are called tight junctions, these sealing feet of the astrocyte. Now this is so critically important, and the statement to be made about it is so, so important. It's kind of take home message. Anything that goes into your blood has the potential for disrupting the blood-brain barrier. If it does, then it can transfer into the brain. Now of course, we do this all the time. Glucose, the only fuel used by the brain, is being transferred all the time. And so, in fact, it's a complex method of transport. If you take a skin capillary, the cells that form the capillary have loose junctions, so glucose can simply diffuse through. But in the brain, these end feet of the astrocytes actually have glucose transporting proteins to take glucose from plasma into the brain. This is an energy dependent mechanism and critically reliant on the oxygen availability. So if you actually render this, this cell network inflamed by actually putting something in the circulation, and the worst case would be intravenous injection of drugs <coughs> containing particulates, in other words, addicts who make their own stuff and inject main line. And if you put particulates into the brain, then you can disrupt this critical barrier and also disrupt, disrupt this active transport of the age of glucose, which the, the, the brain depends on. So the blood-brain barrier is a protected environment for the brain, relies on endothelial tight junctions, is least secure in venules to allow the traffic of white blood cells, lymphocytes, into the brain to control viruses. 80% of us have resident virus in the brain. <coughs> However, the blood-brain barrier can be damaged by a wide variety of blood-borne agents causing inflammation. And this is, I would, this is a new term called the microvascular syndrome. I'll give you some examples of things that don't come to mind in the profession, in the medical profession, as damaging the blood-brain barrier. And the first one is malaria. Red cells can actually take in the parasite. It changes the conformability of the red cell. It then rumbles around in the circulation and can damage the blood-brain barrier. So those people who die with malaria die of brain swelling because water transfers across the damaged barrier. The parasite of malaria does not go into brain tissue. It only goes into the red cell. In what we call reperfusion injury, the white cells that we all have circulating, the neutrophils, can cause inflammation. Again, a complex topic. Chemical agents, carbon monoxide, alcohol, drugs, prescribed drugs, as for example in chemotherapeutic agents, and non-prescribed drugs, which is of course what this conference is about. Radiation used for brain malignancies damages the barrier, and of course a lot of other things. But the area that I have spent my professional life in over the last 40 years is where bubbles in divers, or for that matter, in aviators, military aviators, actually get in the circulation. But the key factor to all of this is it triggers inflammation. So <clears throat> this is the commonest disease associated with blood-brain barrier disturbance. And this, of course, is the brain of a living patient. I'm indebted to Yulan Guy in New York for this slide, which is a seven Tesla magnet MRI. This is the cutting edge of research. And at this level, you can actually see down to the venules involved in MS. MS is a microvascular syndrome. Now that's heresy. 
All the conventional wisdom says it's a so-called autoimmune disease. Again, I'm a heretic. I don't believe in autoimmunity. What comes first is inflammation. The immunity is in a repair mechanism that we've mistakenly caused a disease called a disease process. But that brings me on to, oh dear, <coughs> the next slide, hopefully. What's been said about MS, and this is extraordinary. Alistair Constant is professor of neurology at Anna Brooks, the medical school of course being Cambridge. The first problem that has to be understood in MS is the nature of the damage, oh, I've just realized, oh dear, Paris in the, the spring. It just shows how often you check slides, there's always a mistake, is the nature of the damage to the blood-brain barrier. And he wrote that all the way back in 1991. But neurologists don't have anything to address blood-brain barrier damage. So I have to tell you a little bit about the background of pressure chambers in medicine, not in diving or in aviation, but in medicine. Because if you were around in medicine in the 1950s, this was the thing to have. Huge chambers were put in so many different centers. And who actually pulled the strings? The cardiac surgeons. Because they wanted to stop the heart to replace the valve. And they didn't have a heart-lung machine. So they literally had to cause cardiac arrest in a patient who was very cold and breathing a high level of oxygen. So they, they chilled the patient, gave them oxygen at twice the pressure in this room, 100%, and then you can have one hour of cardiac arrest without brain damage. So obviously you need a good pair of hands if you're going to put a tricuspid valve in in that time or whatever. So this was the hyperbaric operating theatre chamber on the roof of the Western Infirmary in Glasgow that was installed by Sir Charles Illingworth in 1959. So this was a photograph that was taken in 1960. And what I'm going to show you now is a very busy slide. Oh, if the slide comes up. <laughs> the effect of oxygen, of course, under pressure because it's a gas, on brain blood flow and the venous oxygen tension of blood throwing, flowing through the brain. What they found is that if you go into a pressure chamber and double atmospheric pressure and breathe 100% oxygen, the blood flow through the brain changes by 20%. Now I want to imagine, you want you to imagine that I had a bottle of pills and I came around and gave every one of you a pill and said, right, take that, it will reduce the blood flow through your brain by 20%. Would you be happy doing it? No, of course not. However, you can certainly do it in a pressure chamber, and divers do it all the time, so do aviators, and so do the people on the International Space Station. The arterial oxygen pressure is increased by at least a factor of 10, but here is, here is the nub of the problem. To get the venous level from 50 to 70, you've got to have 100 to 1,000 in the arteries. Now, given time, I could explain the physics of it. It's, it's not magical, it's a simple bit of physics, but we don't have, have time. But the take-home message is breathing more oxygen is the only way to actually reduce blood flow and reduce swelling whilst increasing, improving the oxygen delivery to cells. Well, all of this now is beginning to come across from the biologists doing the research into mainstream medicine. I don't think I really would offend too many people if I said the New England Journal of Medicine is the leading clinical journal in the world. It's not the oldest, the Lancet happens to be the oldest, but as, in terms of clinical journals, it's a country mile better than the Lancet. And this now is 2011, and the relationship between lack of oxygen and inflammation, however it's caused, is now the subject of nine whole pages as a review in the New England Journal of Medicine. That is astounding. And I'm really privileged to see so much of the stuff I've been involved with experimentally, clinically, now actually getting into mainstream journals. But the most remarkable thing about it is that in all of the nine pages of this paper, hypoxia is not defined. Imagine using a word countless times in nine pages in the leading clinical journal in the world, and you don't define the word you're using. Strange. Well, <clears throat> my real involvement clinically has been in a charity setting, not in the hospital I worked in, because neurologists control 
patients who have multiple sclerosis. But I had the pleasure and privilege of being involved with five patients in 1981 because I had a chamber in a private hospital and did a little study with a neurologist, with the equipment of the hospital, based on a study that was being done in New York University. Uh, you must remember that the, the mavericks, and I count myself a maverick, who use more oxygen than mainstream medicine, we are a bit of a fraternity because we've got to stay together. <laughs> United we stand, divided we fall. This trial was funded in 1978 in New York University, and it was the lead author is Boguslav Fischer, who sadly is the late Boguslav Fischer. And it was funded by the MS Society of America to show that giving more oxygen was a waste of time for MS patients. They showed just the opposite. And within a matter of months, the chamber was removed from the hospital and was in the parking lot when I visited Bo Fisher, who became a friend of mine, in September of 1982. So this was published in 1983. Okay, so what did they do? They took 40 patients with advanced chronic disease, minimum disease, sorry, average disease duration, 10 years. And remember that the words multiple and sclerosis mean many scars. Sclerosis is simply scarring. So you have scarring for 10 years, you're going to give a tiny bit more oxygen and expect miracles. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Let me just go over the, the details. Objective improvement occurred of 12, in 12 of 17 patients treated with hyperbaric oxygenation, but only one of 20 treated with a placebo. In other words, the level of oxygen that's in this room. That gave a p-value of 0 0.0001. Improvement was transient in seven of the patients treated with more oxygen and long-lasting in five. Those with less severe forms of the disease had a more favorable and lasting response. What a surprise. Isn't that extraordinary? At one year of follow-up, so these patients had a month of treatment, a little more oxygen, five days a week, for a month, four weeks. So, um, sorry, a full total of 40 treatments. At one year of follow-up with no further treatment, deterioration was noticed only two patients in the oxygen group, neither of whom had an initial response, and in 11 patients in the placebo group, the p-value 0 0.0008. Imagine that you had a drug and you produce these levels of significance. From a drug that's intrinsically harmless, is physiologically entirely defensible, and actually has a bucket load of science behind it. You could, you could see this, the share price go up and up and up. But Bo Fisher had to put this in. These preliminary results suggest, only suggest, a positive, though transient, effect on advanced multiple sclerosis, warranting further study. Notice the word transient there. It's also here, because objective improvement uh, it was transient in seven, but long-lasting in five. These five long-lasting patients, they disappeared in this final sentence. What an extraordinary thing. Absolutely extraordinary. So, what are we talking about? When it comes to using oxygen, and I'm sure Dr. Lawless will, uh, will, will concur with this, we are really operating outside mainstream medicine and using oxygen as a treatment. So don't expect controlled double-blind trials to actually be funded in, for example, drug addiction. It won't happen. It's an enormously expensive thing to do. The Fisher study at New York University cost $250,000 in 1978. Well, translate that into today's value, and you're talking again in millions. So it won't happen. You, you can't look for controlled studies. But what we're dealing with is not something we don't know the action of. We're dealing with an agent that we know is essential to the brain, and we know that now that oxygen controls inflammation in the body. So we have every reason to suspect that patients should have a little more oxygen. Well, this is a community center because in 1982, the five patients I was involved with decided to continue, and we founded a center, a charity center, run by patients for patients, and did this in the face of pretty determined opposition from my profession. So we now have a Department of Health approved treatment with 61 centers operating 83 chambers. We've been in operation now for 35 years, 
completed over 30 million, sorry, 3 million sessions without a single serious incident of any kind. In 2008, after coming under regulation by the Healthcare Commission, uh, we were deregulated on the basis of this being too safe. In fact, it's very simple. Patients are actually safer inside here than they are outside, safer than you are sitting in this room. Why? Because lack of oxygen characterizes some very serious illnesses that can affect any of you at, at any time. A stroke, a heart attack, muscle dies, the brain dies because of lack of oxygen, not lack of anything else. So they're safe places. What of course are not safe are the kind of, kind of hyperbaric chambers that I flew down in from Edinburgh this morning. Because <laughs> I was up at 38,000 feet. How, how stupid can you be sitting in this little aluminium tin can at 38,000 feet, hoping that the pressure holes and the window doesn't blow out? In fact, now, in over a three year period, the number of passenger journeys made using jet transport and hyperbaric chambers with oxygen breathing systems, remember the things that drop down, is now equal to the population of the Earth. 7.4 billion passenger journeys are made over three years in hyperbaric chambers. So if doctors say they've never been in one, you say, well, actually you have. Well, I had to slip these in. Uh, I think I'm still within my time. <laughs> because <coughs> The science is rolling on. I've told you about EPO, and it was biologists who investigated the role of EPO in increasing the red cell count. And so, for example, people that climb Everest, they produce a lot of EPO. Their red cell count goes up from um, very, very basic values. 45% of the volume of blood goes up, sometimes to over 65%. Also, climbers on Everest produce 50% more capillaries in the brain at base camp, spending, spending their, their time acclimatizing. Isn't that extraordinary? Nobody has yet sacrificed an Everest climber to see if they've got 50% more capillaries. They've done it in rats. Um, however, there are 200 corpses in the death zone of Everest, so there's pathological material there. Forgive my, my calm sense of humor. <laughs> It really is extraordinary that people still climb it. And you talk about addiction, that's addiction to lack of oxygen. So this is a paper recently released from, in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, not a clinical journal, and it's about how giving more oxygen, and you need a pressure chamber, giving more oxygen alters genes. And so what I've done is a, a basic summary, and I'll read this, but let me just explain that this is, this is the control value for this particular gene. This is um, what happens when you give oxygen. It, it jumps up. It increases dramatically. Um, and so this is the time post-oxygen, and you can see it falls down. So this gene, hemox1, encodes, en encodes hemoxygenase, um, and so it has multiple actions, but what I want to focus on is down here, gives its anti-inflammatory properties by the upregulation of interleukin. HSPA1A, heat shock protein, look again, the control of inflammation. Another couple of, of, uh, of genes. This one, involved in the deterioration and elimination of reactive oxidants, enhances cellular antioxidant capacity. Another one, protection against metal toxicity, con contributing to protection against oxidative stress. Another, another range of genes. Again, you see, there's the control value. This is actually produced by giving a large dose of oxygen in a pressure chamber. So this one, FOSB, a target gene found in brain striatal areas, and this is what I found involved in addiction. So when you breathe a high level of oxygen, you are down-regulating genes that are involved in inflammation and even addiction. <coughs> now, I can't say clinically that I understand what this can mean, but what I do know is that it's all positive. All of the things that are described in this paper are all positive. 
and obviously there's, there are people far more competent than I am to talk about the role of these genes in the various pathways that they control. Um, nerve growth factor, and, and so on, and so on. So, conclusions. <clears throat> this is the conclusion of this Annals of New York Academy of Sciences paper. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy could reverse age-related declines in anti antioxidants detoxification enzymes. Cell viability in the oxygen-treated cultures was significantly increased under all the conditions tested. General stimulatory protective effect on endothelial cell viability. This is what we talked about. This means in the brain, the blood-brain barrier. So it can protect against oxidative insults in endothelial cells. And finally, um, they're protected against an otherwise lethal oxidative stress in the conditions of the experiments they used. I don't have time to talk about that. But I put this slide in because it's been my privilege to work with the, um, Dr. McCann and, and Mr. McCann and the staff of Castle Craig Hospital in the provision of a hyperbaric facility. And I haven't been clinically involved, I've just been helping them on the, principally on the technical side. But I've noted that the, the patients find that they can sleep. And that is so important. Sleep is actually quite dangerous because we desaturate our oxygen levels during sleep and interrupted sleep can lead to a change in the oxygen levels in the body. But I came across this remarkable picture which shows actually the elimination system for toxins in the brain. We don't have a lymphatic circulation, which we have in the rest of the body with lymph glands and, and actual lymphatic ducts in the brain. The, the harmful substances track along the outside of blood vessels. And so this is a, an artery in the brain of a mouse. The green and yellow are cerebrospinal fluid traveling outside the artery. Um, so this is the elimination system. Now we don't know why we sleep. If anybody in the room does, please correct me, but I, I, I understand nobody knows when we sleep. We certainly know it's harmful not to sleep, and of course it's used as a method of torture. So we have to sleep, and sleep must be the elimination of something which would otherwise harm, harm us. So if we have a way of reducing brain swelling, the whole brain swells in relation to the inflammation that can be caused, especially by intravenous agents. If we have a way of reducing brain swelling and improving the oxygen levels in the brain to reduce inflammation, then it's very, very clearly important in a therapeutic sense. But of course, we can't patent oxygen. So all of the, all of the intelligence in medicine is that it produces energy by burning glucose and adenosine triphosphate. But as I've said, controlling the cardiac output, regulation of blood flow, all of this so why don't we all breathe more? Well, here's a fundamental problem, that it's not easy to do. It requires equipment, and it requires some knowledge. In reality, it's technically very simple, but it still requires a certain amount of effort. So if you want to look at the growth area for this treatment, it's actually in the veterinary world. So if you're a racehorse, you have a good chance to get in a chamber in America. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I don't see any reason why they can't, thank you, pardon, why they can't be actually trained to operate the chamber, because it is really rather simple. Thank you for your attention.
a pretty good motivator to get people involved in treatment. Um, so uh, now there are other uh, issues that we also uh, can measure. Uh, these are more uh, functional areas that you can test. Uh, and we have a couple of tests that we usually use that's quick. Uh, and I, one is called the ANAMS. Now, those are the uh, letters. I don't remember exactly what they stand for, but uh, one's called the DEBS and one's called the ANAMS. Uh, that's usually the nomenclature that we use. And what they will do is talk about memory loss, they'll talk about executive functions, they'll talk about spatial reasoning, they'll talk about coordination, problem solving, and judgment. Those are all effective. And again, the nice thing is that we can begin to uh, monitor those as a person goes through treatment in terms of how ready are they to go to the next step. Um, so the first phase that we have is called healing brain. And we, we, uh, I can echo everything that James has just got through telling us, talking about how inflammation is a major part. Uh, and we uh, obviously want to uh, de-inflame the brain. Uh, and also we uh, talk about coherence. Uh, with, now coherence is basically measured by how the brain is talking to each other. Uh, in a normal person, uh, hopefully like us, our brain is basically communicating all over the brain in order to find, uh, solve problems and, and learn new material and things like that. Uh, by the way, I'm just gonna digress here for a little bit and say uh, that, that there's an old, uh, saying that is still being used today that we only use 20% or 10% of our brain. That's wrong. We use all of our brain all the time because if we didn't use it, it would dissolve and decay. So basically, I just want to make that point. Uh, now, phase one in terms of the hyper, hyperbaric is just focused on these two aspects. We need to get the brain back working. If you don't get the brain working, it's not going to do any good. And I have a lot of metaphors uh, that have to do with the fact that you can't uh, get a car uh, uh, moving right just by putting a hood on, on it. Uh, the, the whole idea here is that in order for uh, rehabilitation to work, you got to heal the brain. Now, uh, while they're in this is uh, while they're in the uh, hyperbaric chamber, they are, uh, they are recommended that they sleep while they're doing this. And uh, there's been some great articles that just come out that talk about how sleep basically works to, um, to uh, uh, de-inflame the brain on an ordinary basis. Uh, it, it's, uh, there's one article that I love the title that says washing the brain sleep washing the brain. So if we don't get enough sleep, and that's restful sleep, and uh, let me just highlight one of the things that you said. We're not taught how to sleep. We're taught how to be stressed. We are taught how to not sleep, uh, but we're not taught to sleep. And most, most of our, 40% uh, of our patients have problems in sleep. And by using the hyperbaric chamber, uh, we also use a, uh, a sonic stimulation, which is basically a drum beat. Um, when I was working in the burn unit uh, in, uh, in Southwestern Medical School, and we were dealing with the, uh, the kids that got burned, uh, the usual practice at that time was to use six really big guys coming in and holding them down while we did rid them. It's, it was horrible. Uh, but what we learned is that if they listened to um, a heartbeat, that they would go to sleep. And uh, so we've, we've used this a lot uh, in conjunction with uh, hyperbaric in order to aid the, the drumbeat. Now, if you want to know what a drumbeat is, it's uh, data. 
a delta rather. It's a it's a delta rhythm. So consequently, what you're doing is you're uh, aiding uh, by sonic stimulation uh, the brain to go to sleep. Now we also have relaxation CDs that we're, we work with in order uh, to um, help a person uh, sleep hygiene. Um, now that has to do with uh, uh, um, arranging rituals, uh, sleep rituals. Um, kids usually don't know how to do this and adults are worse is how to arrange your, your circadian rhythm so that you can basically uh, get that kind of sleep, the deep sleep that you want. So uh, we have them, instead of watching TV until the very last time that they uh, go and, or uh, go to sleep or uh, when they're trying to also um, uh, solve problems, um, um, have fights, arguments, don't do that when you're trying to go to sleep. Uh, what you want to do basically is to create this way that the brain begins to settle down uh, into a um, restful sleep where you're breathing, breathing uh, in a normal way in a, in a uh, at least maybe 12, 6 to 12 cycles um, long. Uh, I gotta stop here for a second and digress again. Uh, when I was uh, going back and working with the orthopedic surgery division, my specialty was pain. And so what we found is that if uh, we allowed a person to listen to a, a CD like this right after surgery, uh, it uh, was remarkable. In fact, it, I got an article uh, published on it that showed that um, I think we used around 50 patients. Uh, we had absolutely no um, uh, um, in, uh, complications. Uh, the, the patients uh, didn't even use pain medicine. Um, they uh, got out of the hospital earlier and obviously were healthy. So just by uh, creating this deep sleep and, and it was based obviously on breathing patterns. Uh, I did several research um, uh, topics on this, wrote a book on it uh, about the various uh, sleep patterns that uh, you can teach. The one that we uh, taught the patients was basically counting uh, from one to seven uh, as you breathe out and a one to seven as you breathe in. Uh, uh, there's a, a very good uh, research uh, by, by uh, the uh, uh, heart math uh, people uh, that show that if you uh, took your pulse and you time your breathing by your pulse rate uh, so that your, your, your heart rate variability basically stabilized, uh, that, that would also aid in uh, going to sleep. Uh, going back to the uh, drumming, I have to say that it also helps puppies and little pigs go to sleep faster too. So if you have any pets that, uh, that, aren't, uh, that are crowling it, it doesn't help with cats, by the way. I don't know why that's, that's true. Um, okay, so, um, so again, uh, the first stage is uh, to uh, de-inflame the brain, get it working right, uh, and then begin to um, uh, correct it. Now, let me uh, quickly say that that's a little bit more complicated. Um, when you have an addicted person, uh, there's usually a, uh, a, well, there's usually an underlying issue that has to do with that, except for teenage uh, alcoholics, that's a different story. Uh, but basically, um, they have a disruptive uh, brain pattern to begin with. So uh, you not only have to get the brain healthy, but you have to get it functioning uh, correctly. And we do that with what we call psychoneuroplasticity, um, PNP for short. Now, uh, I'm on the Dr. Phil show a lot, and uh, he, he can't pronounce that word. 
So he just calls it PNP. Uh, so I, you're excused if you can't remember psychoneuroplasticity. But basically, it's a way of changing disru disruptive brain patterns uh, into more constructive. And we uh, use this little machine. It's called the BOD. Uh, it's a sonic uh, stimulator. Uh, sonic nerve uh, brain stimulator and uh, we use it in different ways and basically it just gives off sound it gives off hertz and uh, I won't go into all of this but basically this is used in conjunction with a hyperbaric chamber because we use the extra oxygen to stimulate the positive uh, brain pattern uh, so once we find a frequency that that basically creates um, the brain pattern that we want that we uh, have them listen to it while they're in the hyperbaric chamber now sometimes that is kind of tricky depending on the kind of hyperbaric chamber that you use and I'll talk about that in a minute but uh, let me give you an, um, another uh, example of how we use this this is great for cravings um, it's, uh, it, it can be used once and all the craving goes away, literally. Uh, it's really profound, the impact of sonic stimulation on the brain. Um, what, it, what you do, it just to talk about the steps simply, uh, and we use, uh, we train people uh, of, of all grades of education to use this because it works faster uh, than, uh, than therapy. Um, it, it's, it, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, articles in, in, um, on the website that's called BOD, B-A-U-D, uh, BODtherapy.com. Uh, and basically what you do in uh, the amygdala, where, uh, in the brain, there, that kind of stores uh, pain. Uh, it stores uh, uh, disharmony, it stores all kinds of memory uh, that is uh, dates back uh, to the nonverbal stage of life. So <clears throat> if you uh, are experiencing some kind of, uh, for example, PTSD, uh, that's the amygdala is the main uh, brain focus for storing those kinds of traumatic events. And so what you do basically is you find that frequency that that, that fear um, or depression or whatever is located and, um, and you do this by basically, you can do it in various ways, but one of the ways that you can do this is just merely having the, the patient turn the knob until their fear gets worse. And kids can do this, by, by the way, very well too. Um, so once you find that frequency, then you find uh, on another knob uh, <coughs> the disparity between your right and left ear. And basically that you can say, now where, when does that go away? And you turn it uh, and the patient basically finds that frequency uh, on the other knobs that makes the uh, emotion disappear. Uh, uh, even on um, patients that have been uh, traumatized for years will only take a maximum of three sessions to get rid of it forever. So I'm not trying to sell you on the bot, I'm just saying that this, this stuff works with, with Sonic. So what you do basically is once uh, our, our craving, our depression, uh, those things are very highly, uh, 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 can, can be easily changed, those brain patterns, uh, with sound. Uh, we know this from histories of, of century history in terms of, of using music. And basically what we've done is uh, bring this down to the frequency of the music and uh, because you can't, uh, I, I used to have a big uh, 
library of, of music at CDs and I would say go pick one out, listen to it and see which one will basically make you happy or uh, create some uh, transformation and that just took too long. So basically what we did was we developed this particular machine that would uh, give them control of the specific frequency. So once again, the idea here is that um, once, um, once you find that uh, frequency, then you can reinforce, them, uh, reinforce a new pattern. Uh, and we've used this for, with over 3,000 patients. Um, that basically went through, our, went through our program. Now the principle, principles behind this neuro transformation are basically pretty simple. The first one is that these uh, 200,000 neurons, that when they are equally stimulated, they will begin to cluster. So that's what makes the strength, it's kind of like habit strength. The more uh, neurons that are involved in a particular pattern, the stronger it's going to be. Those neuron patterns will be influenced more and more by the um, hyperbaric chamber and by the neural uh, sonic stimulation. Um, uh, so as, again, uh, well, let me show you some pictures here. This is uh, Laura, and she's uh, sitting outside the uh, hyperbaric chamber uh, going through uh, uh, the um, uh, stimulation that, uh, that the person's in, in terms of stage two. Uh, what happens um, is that, um, well, let me just go through it now. Uh, when you have 100% oxygen hyperbaric chamber, which is what we call the hard side uh, approach, um, you can't have any electrical stuff going on at all. So you have to do it through um, an outside uh, input. If you're using a soft side hyperbaric chamber, uh, which is uh, not 100% oxygen, and sometimes it's oxygen that's enriched, but basically this is called the home units. These are home uh, uh, units that you can you can buy and put in your home. In fact, most of the uh, NFL football players have uh, these hyperbaric chambers in their homes uh, for that reason. This particular patient is kind of interesting in the sense that uh, she had uh, memory loss. Uh, she was a teacher, and um, uh, she actually didn't intentionally take drugs, but some drugs were uh, given to her, I think, for sexual reasons. And when she came back, she had no memory, no immediate memory. Uh, when she taught school, if she talked to one student uh, and turned away and come back to the same student, she couldn't remember who they were. Um, and so consequently, we did um, hyperbaric chamber with uh, stimulating that particular part of her brain memory uh, sections and uh, it did bring back her memory. Uh, kind of fascinating stuff. Um, which gets me to the to another uh, application. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, we go to another application where we actually use the EEG to trace down the specific lobe or the area of the brain that it's not functioning very well. And then we have the patient use the bod to see if that particular frequency made a difference in that particular part of the brain. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple stuff. Uh, but as you said, I don't know any big government grants come down to a part to look at this, but basically, um, one of the things that's fascinating to me is if you take a drug addict that is using a particular favorite drug, uh, you can use that history um, to, uh, magnif to, to bring about positive changes instead of the negative. And let me just give you an example. Um, if a person has been using cocaine, uh, 
Sometimes we just tell, give them bod and say, I want you to create the same feeling you get that you do with, with cocaine. And all of them can do that. I mean, it's easier for them to do it than the non-drug user, I think. Um, if they, if they, because the path's already set up, all you have to do is say, okay, use it like a radio and just dial in what you, when you want to pleasure yourself. Now, sooner, <coughs> sooner or later, they won't need the bot because they can do it with their own brain control because the neurons keep building up in the, in the right direction. Um, so we also use it with co-occurring disorders. Um, there's a pretty high percent. I don't think these these uh, percentages are right, but there's some uh, articles on this. But basically, um, there, uh, if a person is uh, self-medicating, for example, with, for depression, um, it, you you you'll see their eyes light up when they find that frequency that starts to create the pleasure in in their brain. And then you put in a, put them in the uh, hyperbaric chamber, and you you can even have them remember what that frequency is. It'll still bring about the the right kind of response that you want. It's this is really great in terms of time uh, time uh, frame and uh, doing something uh, that will basically change a person's brain literally. And once they once the uh, neurons start firing in that positive direction, then uh, then it it stays that way. It, it stays that way. We've done ten year follow ups uh, with only one or two uh, sessions, and um, it, it's amazing how that does. Now, one of the most powerful ways of using uh, this approach is with pain itself. Um, in fact, it's more effective than the emotional state. I don't know why, uh, really, but it does. And so we get, uh, when we get patients that have been uh, prescribed medications for their pain, uh, then we have them use, again, the same methodology uh, works, is that you find ways for the brain to uh, cut off the, uh, the um, suffering component and begin to have them experience positive joy and satisfaction. So, let's see if I have anything else I want to say. Yeah, um, there's some uh, recommendations, I guess, uh, if you want to put it that way. These are more observations that uh, I think uh, might be helpful to other people. Um, one is that we talked again about the soft side and the hard side. Uh, we've experimented, I won't say experimented, but we've observed people using um, the home units. Uh, we observe them using the, uh, what was called the oxygen enri enriched home units. And then we have the 100% um, oxygen. And to tell the truth, we can't do the, tell the difference between, uh, between outcomes. Um, the, um, the hard side are extremely more expensive, and you have to create an environment uh, for, for fire and a jillion other reasons why, and it has to be medically supervised. Uh, for the home units, uh, you don't have those. So uh, we, we've been ordering this unit. It's called the Oxy oxy um, unit and it's the soft side and it has the uh, bars that basically help it uh, um, from uh, uh, help it where it will create enough uh, pressure to make uh, make a difference now how much pressure do you need we find uh, there's a uh, there's a typo in that number two basically it should be uh, 1.2 to 1.3 very slow, very light pressure because what happens is the brain doesn't like high pressure. It, it seems to work better. It doesn't react so much uh, when you have low pressure. It seems to be more comfortable too. 
So again, number three, uh, I recommend that, uh, uh, especially for addiction, that you need to include two phases of hyperbaric. Um, recommend that you use sonic stimulation and um, and now just this little caveat is that I think that this is basically an uncharted territory and uh, so uh, I'd be willing to tell you what I think uh, if you guys are interested in uh, uh, using this particular approach. So I think that's it. Oh, yeah, one other thing that we use with the hyperbaric chamber is a diet. Um, somehow sugar itself is really uh, detrimental to the brain. Um, and uh, so we just basically have a person go on very high protein uh, foods and um, you basically get the whole picture with just these three categories. So, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, really quickly. So this um, device, is it as effective as a fact that you change, stop changing the clients in the clinic, they benefit from just having the... Uh, yeah, they, um, we've used it <coughs> both ways. We, we like to use the hyperbaric, especially in the phase one. But uh, if you want to uh, uh, use the, the sonic stimulation without the hyperbaric, it, it'll work too. I just like to use it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, as long as uh, we use it, also create uh, high back chambers, as well as a strong emphasis on time, and also a strong emphasis on exercise. Sir? I think Physical it's... exercise. Oh, yeah, with exercise, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exercise um, <clears throat> is uh, critical, not only in terms of um, the rhythm. Uh, I like stretching exercises. I, I like the whole notion of uh, looking at balance rather than just uh, strength. Uh, unfortunately, especially our guys like to go out and compete with each other and uh, tend to hurt themselves. Under supervision. <laughs> yeah, sir. Yes. Have a question. When we were talking about God, they were very much thinking about, I mean, I don't think they similar. Is there something with EMDR? You know, EMDR works also with rhythmical. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I was, I was trained in that. Um, the, let me just give you my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, is that when you deal with trauma, uh, you don't want to have them re-experience and re-experience and re-experience. So it can go two ways. It can be good or bad. Um, I've seen too many therapists go over the same thing and it made it worse and worse and worse. And, kind of, and it took a long time to get past that. Um, it can be used for, for positive, uh, but I can't I can't divide up the therapist or the the attributes or anything uh, or even the type of patient that benefit one way or another. Uh, so uh, I'm a little leery. Very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can I just ask about um, the way you use the example of pain as the least controversial? Yes. Does the sonic stimulation effectively turn off the pain or just tune it out? It's, uh, it can tune it out, totally, uh, uh, just by the sonic stimulation. Now, it may be that you're just disrupting that, that frequency. Uh, that's what I think is happening, uh, that pain frequency. We, we have gates of, of pain uh, from a all the way from, uh, you know, from your fingertip all the way to your brain. So it makes sense that it just cuts off that uh, particular suffering. I call it the suffering uh, issues. So much, especially back pain, uh, relates to a, a feeling of being a victim. Can, can I ask if, um, if you're not 
is this transient or, or is it forming in your it's, it's it's constant. It go it it stays. So you don't have to be listening to that particular sonic stimulator. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of research that, that we know about that's electrical stimulation. I think it probably works the same way, only we don't, we just use sound. Yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> I've worked on um, the electrical stimulation of the electrical stimulation of the Warburg's work after the Second World War is extraordinary. 
there is a universal feature of all cancer cells, regardless of the type of cancer, they all switch to glycolysis. Now, any of you who have exercised on an exercise bicycle, um, you will have encountered the burning that occurs in the muscle. And that's lactic acid buildup. And everybody has assumed that that happens because, in fact, you run out of oxygen in the exercising muscle. Not true. It is actually switched genetically by the very protein I've talked about, HAF1. So there's a genetic switch to glycolysis. So what's happening in cancer cells is, for some reason, they're switching to glycolysis. And we don't know why. But there are very large units in America now going down the Warburg route because the lapse of time has meant that his work has become a little more respectable. I'd like to add to that kind of a little saga, which I think is fun in medicine, is that I don't know how many years ago, not, not too long ago, about 15 years ago, somebody was, um, some scientist came up and showed that the cancer cell uh, they thought was using oxygen to build up on itself. So there was about 20 pharmacies that developed uh, medicines that basically would keep uh, the um, uh, cancer cell from using oxygen. So what happened was they uh, proliferated and metastasized and got worse. So everybody has scrapped that whole theory and now we're going back to this particular yes. stance. Oxygen is, uh, oxygen is an inhibitor of cancer. And one of the problems with tumors is that initially the hypoxia associated with the cellular growth, because it's uncontrolled, a bit like the growth of an embryo, it grows the oxygen levels in, in, internally in the, in the cellular environment falls. And what happens then, that switches on vascular endothelial growth factor, the very thing I've been talking about. As the tumor then grows, the rate of growth exceeds the ability to actually grow a microcirculation, to grow capillaries in the tumor. And so the central center of the tumor actually becomes necrotic. I'm generalizing in a, in a rather broad way, but, but this is a, a, a reasonable generalization that um, oxygen inhibits actual cancer cells. And there have been, it, it, the, whole, the whole of this area, as I've perhaps indicated, with the New England Journal of Medicine article on hypoxia and inflammation. All of this is, is now in the ferment. Um, uh, Semenza's work on oxygen sensing, oxygen signaling, oxygen free radical signaling. We're in a cauldron of, of immense complexity and it's very, very difficult to tease out individual components. But there is absolutely no question that Cancer, inflammation, white cell activity, they're all related to hypoxia. I've got a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah please, thank you. Uh, actually, for both of you. Uh, the principle of uh, using hyperbolic oxygen in MS, I mean, is it similar to uh, a lot of football players with injuries have hyperbolic oxygen therapy? So is, is, it, is the principle similar to you know, uh, the MS uh, centers with hyperbolic oxygen. Uh, that's the first question. Um, One at a time. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, I think I can shout loud enough to be make, make myself heard. Yeah. What we're dealing with is tissue injury. Now, where's the principle? There's a very, very simple pr principle. If a tissue is injured, it doesn't really matter how it's injured. It not only involves the cells in that tissue, it involves the microcirculation that is providing those cells with nutrients and with oxygen. So if we take a traumatic injury in football, it's associated with damage to the microcirculation, loss of water into the surrounding area, and water actually reduces oxygen transport. That's why we have red blood cells, because we can't transport enough oxygen dissolved in plasma to keep us alive unless we have a hyperbaric chamber. So the similarity, MS, the only, th only commonality between neurologists, pathologists, and me in the MS scene, um, because I'm the kind of enfant terrible in the United Kingdom, having started all these centers, um, the only commonality is the word inflammation. And inflammation and hypoxia go together. 
and as I said, it's really a very exciting time. From my personal point of view, it's an extraordinary time because everything I've fought for, all of a sudden I've lived long enough to see it all coming together. But the most of the work is not being done by the medical profession or even the pharmaceutical industry. Most of the work is actually done by biologists. But we're in London, so of course we have a National Hospital for Neurological Disease in Queen Square. It's the Department of Neuroinflammation that is looking into multiple sclerosis now. It used to be called demyelinating disease. The professor there is a friend of mine, Ken Smith, and he's now using models of inflammation and using oxygen to treat the model. But that, unfortunately, is where it stops because animal models, neurologists will say, if you haven't done an animal model, they'll say, where's your animal model? If you've done it, they say, it's only an animal model. <laughs> so it's a catch-22. Um, but the, the whole of this now, especially with magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy, the whole of this now is focusing on the microcirculation. So footballers get microcirculatory damage, just as MS patients do. And the commonality is that hypoxia and inflammation are linked. Thank you. Uh, the oh, other question was uh, about horse placenta treatment. I mean, I'm sorry. Horse placenta. The, uh, I mean, again, this is uh, this is again with sports uh, persons. I mean, a lot of them with you know ankle inflammations. They have. I, I think it's a Dutch concept of horse placenta treatment. I mean, uh, has it got anything to do with uh, with uh, the horses? Horse, horse placenta. Horse. What's horse. 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 Horses. Horses, yeah. Okay, okay, you mean the veterinary treatment? Yeah, horse, horse placenta <laughs> treatment is yes. used for inflammation, for subsiding inflammation, for injuries. Uh, it, I, I think it's a Dutch concept. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I think one of the players, Robin Van Persie, is a football player from, from Netherlands. He uses that treatment a lot. So he was talking about that. I mean, has it got anything to do with? Uh, uh, I have the faintest idea. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Um, you were talking about um, the uh, hyperbaric treatment for pain, right? What about the experience maybe with fibromyalgia? Is that what you call fibromyalgia? You know, unexplained pain? Um, does, does that bring a bell? Yeah, it does. Um, we use that, uh, again, with the notion that a person can't relax if, if we're talking about the same thing. It's over, over stress that can't restore itself. Uh, we're way back there. Um, just to say that um, psychiatry, the medics who do mental health stuff, they don't really have the same sort of thing as changing I'm sorry, can you? Sorry, we need a microphone. I just wanted to come in on the f as a, I'm a consultant psychiatrist and to say that um, people are beginning to look at inflammation in the role of psychiatric disorder in schizophrenia. There are papers coming out on that. And I would say, you know, in my training at the Maudsley back in the 80s, we used to laugh at Tim Crow, who was an eminent psychiatrist who purported that um, uh, schizophrenia could maybe be um, a viral illness or whatever. It was all like, how on earth could anything be infectious? But uh, I'm a child psychiatrist, and I see adolescents who've had Lyme's disease. Oh, yes. And they, uh, Lyme's disease, um, in, in, in children who have neurodevelopmental disorder, very, very high functions, very bright kids who've got neurodevelopmental disorder, some ASD and some ADHD, and when they get Lyme's disease, they then become extremely ill, severe, severe OCD. I've had to <coughs> hospitalize them. Um, and just to say that when you look at Lyme's disease, it's caused by a spirochete. Well, we can think about syphilis, that was caused by a spirochete, and you look at the way in which Lyme disease progresses, and it gives you a rash. Well, secondary syphilis, you get the rash, the primary disorder, the, the, the secondary rash, and the tertiary symptoms are general paresis of the insane, note insane. So it's as if 
there are many other agents, and because I think it's the way um, the epistemes, if you like, the epistemologies with which these discourses in medicine and psychiatry constructed actually eliminate certain other ways of thinking. And the other problem we have in the UK now is that actually because of nice guidelines, nobody, nobody at the cutting edge of their thinking in clinical practice can actually progress anything because you haven't got the knowledge or the influence or the, 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 just as you were describing, it's a catch-22. So unless you've done a ton of research, you can't use a new treatment that you have perceived might work because you've seen it in something else and maybe that. And I've seen so many very bright clinicians across the field in medicine who are stuck in just these. Uh, and then you have, you know, CQC and God knows what and all the managers and they just say, you know, no, you can't do that and this is a serious incident because you've used this drug and it isn't. You know, the BNF doesn't say you can use it for that. But, you know, how are we to advance medicine if we can't think beyond <coughs> these? Areas? So I'm yeah. delighted to hear of the bio yeah. biologists. I think that the psychiatrists and the neurologists have got to actually change their way of thinking. Yes. <laughs> Very quick response to that. Um, basically, we have to look at oxygen rather differently to drugs simply because nothing functions without it. And so if someone says, ah, this level of oxygen is not indicating whether it uses a hyperbaric chamber or not, what they're saying is that the level of oxygen the patient is actually breathing is the correct level of oxygen, which is absurd. So if we come to control studies, I want you to imagine that we do a controlled study of of diabetes and the control of blood glucose. We produce blood glucose even when we're diabetic. I have to be diabetic, so I know a little about this. But if you do a controlled trial, you can't actually withhold insulin, that is the body's insulin production. You add to it, and it's the same with using oxygen at an increased dose. We need to think of it in terms of dosage. And so if you look actually at pressure variations, the pressure variation in this country at sea level is 10%. Temp oxygen varies by 10%. Now, has anybody noticed that it's, when it's very cold and very low pressure and rainy, you don't feel as good as when it's very high pressure and sunny? Well, what a surprise. Because in fact, dropping oxygen levels by 10%, especially very quickly, actually causes gene changes. I've, I've had a, a chronic injury since childhood my left shoulder, my left arm, and I can't, I can't move this elbow very much, and it's, it sometimes gets inflamed. If the weather, if the atmospheric pressure drops, I know, because it gets very achy. And I've had this now, I was 10 when I had my cycle accident, so I'm now 75, so I've had uh, many years to experience this, and it's totally reliable. So we have to look at oxygen rather differently, because we're looking at the dose. And while I'm talking about dose, if you're in the death zone and efforts, <coughs> the actual oxygen equivalent <coughs> delivers only 2 or 3% more oxygen to a, dive, to a climber who's actually dying of lung swelling and brain swelling. The oxygen equipment used in the death zone on Everest is only 2 or 3% more because they can't carry enough oxygen in the cylinders up to the top of Everest. That means the difference between life and death on Everest. Now, has anybody done a controlled study on the top of Everest of whether oxygen can be proven to be effective in mountain sickness? Of course not. Everybody knows it works. So I think we have to view oxygen like insulin. We have to look at the dose and not accept the dose that we get every day uh, because of changes of atmospheric pressure. So as I said, you know, I sound like an evangelist. It's because I am. <laughs> but, but in my, my clinical practice, I've, I've got a part, I had a part-time appointment in the NHS and the university because my parish was the North Sea. And I started being involved uh, with Royal Navy training in 1972 and then I got involved with companies. So I've, I've been, if you like, in private practice offshore. The things that I've seen are miraculous, but I hesitate to work, use the word miraculous. I've seen people on the point of death within hours wake up. Even in the hospital when I treated carbon monoxide poisoning, have somebody come in, blue lights, you know, all the alarm bells flashing, you put them in a chamber, they're areflexic, the pupils are dilated, an hour later they're sitting up in the chamber. And you want proof? 